So tonight, we are going to take a look at one of my favorite creatures from ancient Egypt, the Sphinx. Now, when we think about, we hear the word Sphinx, we immediately think Egypt, right? I mean, a few of us might think about the Greek Sphinx, but we're gonna cast that aside for the moment. And we might think of this character here, the Great Sphinx from Giza. Now, for those of us who spend a lot of our time in and around the Penn Museum, there is really only one Sphinx that we talk about, and that is this one, um, which is on display in our lower Egyptian gallery, right there in the center of the gallery, greeting people, as he has done for the past almost, well, over 100 years at this point. But these aren't the only two Sphinxes I'd like us to think about tonight. We're gonna to take a look at what this icon, what this image, what this creature, this fantastic beast, what he was to the ancient Egyptians, and consider why it is that even today, when we wander around Philadelphia, we visit foreign cities, we go to cemeteries, we come face to face with images of ancient Egyptian sphinxes, whether they're actually ancient sphinxes or whether they're modeled on, sometimes a little less uh, ancient Egyptian than we might expect, um, or whether they're just sort of completely fantastic. So here are two wonderful examples, sort of turn of the century, guardian sphinxes guarding a mausoleum in a modern cemetery. Um, here also from a cemetery, an image of a sphinx that is commemorating uh, soldiers killed during the Civil War. So you think this is a strange combination, the Civil War in the United States and an Egyptianizing Sphinx. Uh, we can travel, as I said, to cities abroad and encounter the Sphinx. The Sphinx is all around us. You can go to a cafe in Paris and enjoy some uh, patisserie. Uh, you can go right downtown um, to First and Ch Chestnut, Front and Chestnut, and go to the Sphinx Cafe. Um, so again, the Sphinx is everywhere. And the Sphinx turns up in very strange places. Sphinx imagery is used by advertisers to sell everything from biscuits to spark plugs um, to all kinds of strange things. Sphinxes appear in literature, whether it's high literature or um, somewhat more colorful literature. Um, for those of you who do yoga, you may be familiar with the Sphinx pose. So the Sphinx can also help you relax and be calm and come center yourself. Uh, Sphinxes, again, used to sell things, wonderful advertising labels for fruit, um, Sphinx grapes, Sphinx peaches, um, you name it, put a Sphinx on it and it will sell. Here you all are at a lecture about the Sphinx, see? Um, if you find yourself in Menton, France, um, during the annual Lemon Festival, you can experience the wonder of a gigantic Sphinx made entirely out of lemons and oranges. Um, I was also sort of captivated by this Anubis, also made out of oranges, um, but that's a little separate, although he is also a, a legendary creature and a, a fantastic beast. So what is it about this, this figure, this iconic image of ancient Egypt? The Sphinx, in its sort of purest form that we see here, is a hybrid creature. It's made up of two different parts, two different creatures coming together and forming a, a whole, a, a unity. And the Egyptians were fantastic at doing these composite creatures, these hybrids. If you take a look at any image of a scene of ancient Egyptian gods and goddesses together, there is this wonderful array of combinations of humans with animal heads, occasionally an animal with a human head, um, and it is done so masterfully that you don't even realize you're looking at something that cannot possibly exist in the real world. Um, we, they were also masters at combining more than one creature. So here, for example, a very dangerous creature. This is the devourer demon known as Amamet or Amet. And this was the creature that was poised at the scale, at the weighing of the heart, waiting for the heart of the deceased to be deemed heavier than the feather of Ma'at. It would then be fed to the devouring demon 
and the individual would die a second permanent death. So this creature, this is a horrific monster. This is something the Egyptians don't want to encounter at all. And this creature is comprised of the head of a crocodile. The front part of the body is that of a, a leopard or some sort of a, a wild cat. And then the rear part of the animal is made up of a hippopotamus. So all of these dangerous creatures combine together into this fearsome idea of something that would strike terror into the heart of the ancient Egyptians. Note also, when you're talking about hybrid um, beings, we have here Anubis, head of a jackal, body of a man, and our god Thoth, the god of wisdom, the inventor of writing, with the head of an ibis and the body of a man. Again, you've seen him before, you don't even notice that this combination, this combining is happening. Now, you saw a scary, dangerous composite creature. Here, um, another of the ancient Egyptian gods, another deity, um, or a group of deities, um, the most common of which, the most well-known of which, is the goddess Taweret. Taweret, in contrast to Amamet, is a protective goddess, but she too is made up of a variety of different creatures, all of them dangerous, all of them scary, but her fearsome image of the, the hippopotamus combined with the, the paws, the legs of a, of a lion, and the tail of a crocodile, her image is meant to ward off evil to protect people from evil. And so we can see the Egyptians have this ability, they have this understanding of how to combine these creatures to scare people or to scare evil away. When we look um, at some of the fantastic creatures, legendary beings that the Egyptians envision, some of the best examples and some of the most unusual examples of these creatures can be found on objects like these. These are magical wands. They're also known as birth wands. They're made of hippopotamus ivory, so it's carved right from the tusk of a hippopotamus. And on these wands, which we believe were used during the birth process, are carved a whole series of fantastic sort of demon-like creatures um, as well as protective imagery. And all of these images served sort of the same purpose that Taweret's scary appearance served, that is to ward off evil. They served an apotropaic purpose to protect the laboring woman as she's trying to give birth to her child. And so there are wonderful things on here, and it may be a little difficult to make it out, but you have things like serpopards, these leopards, these leonine creatures with long necks that look like they're a combination of a, a snake and a leopard. We have griffins with wings coming off. We have lions, all of them, many of them have snakes coming out of their mouth or flames shooting out of their mouth. Some of them are holding knives and daggers. So this is all meant to ward off evil. When we turn to Egyptian writing, um, what do the Egyptians, how do the Egyptians describe some of these fantastic creatures? And we see um, in some of their literary texts descriptions of creatures that can't exist, shouldn't exist, but the Egyptians describe them so vividly that you can envision exactly what this impossible creature would look like. So from the story of the shipwrecked sailor, which comes to us from the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, we have a tale of a, a man who has gone on a, a sea journey together with many other sailors. There's a terrible storm at sea. The, the, the ship is destroyed. He's cast on an island by himself um, in the middle of nowhere. All of his companions have, have died, and he goes around the island trying to, to make his way, and all of a sudden, he hears this noise, and then he encounters this being. And he sort of hides from it at first, and he says, I uncovered my face, he's talking, and I found it was a snake that was coming. It was 30 cubits long, so this is an enormous, enormous snake. Not only was it very big, it also had a beard. It had that false beard, that element that Egyptian gods, Egyptian kings would have. So this snake, not only is it giant, it's also special. It is a divine creature. Um, it has this, this beard, it's 
lapis lazuli, it has gold on it, it has all of these um, elements that indicate to this sailor that this is a, a divine creature, this is something, something very special. If it's not enough that it is gigantic and imbued with all these divine attributes, the snake also talks. And the snake speaks to the sailor and says, and asks him, who brought you? How, how did you get here? How, you know, little one, commoner, how did you get here? Um, and he, the snake threatens him and says, if you don't tell me um, how you got here, I'm going to cause that you to know yourself. I'm going to basically put you into fire and, you know, and burn up. So he makes this threat so that the sailor will um, explain himself and how he came to be on the snake's island. So the Egyptians in their art could create these fantastic creatures. In their writing, in their literature, they could describe, bring to life these fantastic creatures. So it's not so surprising that the Egyptians were able to conceive of this hybrid creature this, the Sphinx, um, as something very, very powerful and um, very, very iconic for the ancient Egyptians. When we look at the typical sort of archetypal Egyptian Sphinx, what are some of the elements? What are the elements that make up sort of the basic Sphinx? Um, what you see here, essentially the Sphinx has the head of a human and the body of a lion at its barest, barest form. Um, in addition to that, the Sphinx usually wears a Nemi's headdress. And like the snake in the shipwrecked sailor story, the, the Sphinx also has a false beard. Both of these are um, signs or indications that the individual presented here uh, is, is a king, is, is a royal, royal figure. Um, and so here on this wonderfully large and impressive Sphinx, which is now in the Louvre, you see that headdress, you see that false beard indicating a sign of, of royalty. And these clues are, th these iconographic uh, images are, are clues to the, the viewer who's looking at the statue of what it is that they are um, encountering. Now, as I said, the archetypal Egyptian Sphinx usually has the body of a lion. And this combination of the lion and the human elements, these two coming together, give this figure the, the power, the awesome physical power that the lion has, as well as the supreme sort of intellect, the capability that man or that the, the king as a, a divine or semi-divine figure would have. So those two forces coming together make it, you know, a force to be reckoned with. Now, sometimes there are variations um, in, the, in the form of the Sphinx, but um, I, I would argue that the head of the man and the body of the lion is probably the, the best way um, to go. Now, when we talk about the Sphinx, the Great Sphinx at Giza, or the Sphinx here in our gallery, or this, the idea of the Sphinx in general, what was the ancient Egyptian word for Sphinx? Well, we come to a bit of a problem there, because there really isn't an exact word that the Egyptians would use for this, this creature. The closest that we can come um, is a word that you see here, for those of you who read hieroglyphs, um, and it is the word seshep ankh, which means living image or living statue. So as we'll see, the ancient Egyptians began to view these images, these images of sphinxes, and in particular, the great sphinx at Giza, as being a, a living statue, as being an entity that that had life, that had, that had powers, and consequently will become worshipped in itself as a god with regard to the, the Sphinx at Giza. Now, as I said, most of the time when we see the Sphinx, it has the body of the lion and the head of a, of a human, usually a man, um, but we do have examples of female sphinxes, sphinxes of queens, um, princesses, or other important women. Um, 
such as the example you see here um, of Shep and Wepet, who held the very important position of the god's wife of Amun um, during Dynasty 25. Oh, here another example of a female sphinx, uh, this one uh, dating to the reign of Amenhotep III, um, perhaps a little bit later, the, the sphinx here holds a, the cartouche um, naming that king. The sphinx, the image of the sphinx, the idea of the sphinx appears quite early in ancient Egyptian art. Um, and we find this image, this being used sort of throughout um, the rest of the pharaonic period. So it is a, an, an iconic image that the Egyptians take to very early and continue to use it. Um, and here we can see examples of various rulers from different periods in Egyptian history all presenting themselves in the form of a sphinx. So we have from the Middle Kingdom up here, Senwazer III, the great pharaoh of the 12th dynasty, being shown um, in sphinx form. Here from Dynasty 18 of the New Kingdom, we have the pharaoh Hatshepsut, that very important female pharaoh who comes to the throne. Um, she continues the tradition of pharaohs um, being shown as sphinxes, and there are quite a number of sphinxes of Hatshepsut um, in this combined leonine human form. And from Dynasty 25, from the Kushite or Nubian period, um, we have this sphinx here. So the Nubian pharaohs of Egypt also continued this tradition of presenting themselves in this um, form. Even Akhenaten, our so-called heretic king of the Amarna period, Dynasty 18, uh, there are examples of Akhenaten being shown in Sphinx form. Some of the Roman emperors also continued to connect the image of the Sphinx um, with their own images. So it's, they're not combined in the same way that the ancient Egyptian pharaohs did, but still you get this idea of the importance of the image of the Sphinx with the, the ruler or the leader of, of the country. Now, the ancient Egyptians, like many ancient peoples and many modern peoples today, uh, were fascinated by the lion, the strength, the power that the lion had, um, and very early on, we begin to see uh, images of lions appearing in Egyptian art. And then we'll notice that this combination of the lion plus the human um, begins to take place. But even as early as the pre-dynastic period in Egypt, we see images of the lion. Um, and probably in cases like this, the lion is representing the power of the king um, attacking, um, attacking enemies. And we have quite a number of ancient Egyptian deities, uh, both male and female, who appear in leonine form. Um, here's a wonderful example of a lion cub. So we're not just limited to adult, fully grown lions in our canon of lions in ancient Egyptian art, uh, but this one dates to the first dynasty. Um, and the lion, as I said, does continue to be associated with the Egyptian pharaoh, uh, whether it's in a, this combined lion human form as the Sphinx, or in images such as this um, from the palace of Merneptah um, here in our collection that's on display in our lower Egyptian gallery. This is a, a door jam from part of an, an entrance into the palace. And you see the king in the center here in that classic ancient Egyptian smiting Pose, getting ready to dispatch a group of enemies. And right here, fighting alongside the king, um, is a, a lion um, getting ready to attack or attacking one of the, uh, the enemies there. Now, as I said, um, lions appear early in Egyptian art, and then we begin to see the introduction of this combined form, this hybrid form. Um, and probably the earliest example that we have, by only a couple moments, um, is, of a sphinx is this one here. Um, it is possible that this is the earliest example. This is a sphinx which belongs to a queen by the name of Hetaperes II. 
Dynasty IV, and she was the daughter of King Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid. So this gives you an idea of, of where we are um, in Egyptian history. So this statue um, appears, and so we have sort of full-blown uh, all the elements that we have seen with our sphinxes, our leonine body, the, the sphinx, the lion shown sort of in this recumbent, resting pose, um, and then the head of the, of the human, in this case, the, the queen. Now, the other of our very early Sphinx images, and um, it's probably very close in age to that of Hetep Harris II, is, of course, the Great Sphinx um, at Giza. This Sphinx um, is a, a true monster, at least with regard to his size. Um, it's about 66 feet tall, um, about 235 feet long, just in, massive. Um, and at the time that it was created, sculptors carved this massive beast um, out of the living bedrock there on the Giza Plateau. And what you see with the Great Sphinx is exactly what we have seen and will see with sphinxes that, that come after. Uh, again, the body of a lion, recumbent. Uh, we have, as with most of our lion sphinxes, the tail curled up here in the back. And again, the, the king wearing the Nemi's headdress, the face of the king um, right there. Now, in, in later times, it seems um, that the sphinx at Giza had a beard attached to it, probably in the New Kingdom. And there are fragments of this beard um, in the collection of the British Museum. But we think that perhaps the original uh, carving of the Sphinx did not include um, that beard. Now the question that is often asked about the, the great Sphinx at Giza is who, who does this represent? Who is the face of the, of the king? Who is the king that's represented there? And over the years, there's been some debate about whether the Sphinx has the face, the facial features of King Khufu, who was the builder of the Great Pyramid, which is located just slightly to the northwest of the, where the Sphinx is located, or does the Sphinx represent um, the son of Khufu, King Khafra, um, who is the builder of the second largest pyramid at Giza. And in fact, the Sphinx is basically in alignment with um, Khafra's pyramid. If you look at a plan um, of the Giza plateau here, uh, here is Khufu's pyramid up here, here is the pyramid of Khafra, the smallest of the three pyramids of Menkaure down here, and the great Sphinx um, in his enclosure is down at this end here, so in alignment with the, the pyramid of Khafra. So it is likely um, that the Sphinx originally had the face of, of King Khafra. Um, that seems to be a, a good suggestion um, for who um, the Sphinx originally represented. And as we'll see over time, this connection between King Khafra and King Khufu is sort of confused even by the ancient Egyptians in a way, and the Sphinx begins to take on a life of his own. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to toss out Greek Sphinxes altogether, but I, I guess I'll, I'll rein that back in for a minute. And, just stress the um, importance in the difference between the Greek Sphinx um, and the Egyptian Sphinx. When we think about Egyptian Sphinxes um, of all shapes and sizes, what we are talking about is a protective entity, someone who, something that is, is powerful and positive. Um, while in contrast, the Sphinx that appears in Greek mythology is a fearsome um, and dangerous creature. Um, and he is best, whoops, best known to us um, from the story of Oedipus. And Oedipus is the one who is able to answer the questions of this horrible creature that had been plaguing um, the city of Thebes for years, and he, Oedipus is the only one that is able to answer the question, and when he answers the question, the riddle of the Sphinx, um, the Sphinx, the Greek Sphinx is so upset that Oedipus was able to answer the riddle that the Sphinx kills itself. So this creature is a malevolent creature, 
completely different from what we are seeing when we look at um, the ancient Egyptian Sphinx. Now, in Egypt, we do have many references to sphinxes and how the ancient Egyptians thought of these, this, these beings, or this being. Um, and in this case, we'll talk in particular about the great sphinx um, at Giza. After the, the fourth dynasty, and then toward the end of the Old Kingdom, the area where the, the sphinx is, between the, the pyramids of, of Khufu and Khafra, becomes less and less used as, as a cemetery place. It's abandoned as a royal burial place. The kings of the Middle Kingdom, the kings of the New Kingdom, are buried elsewhere. So there is sort of a disconnect between the idea of the king and, and Giza. And the figure of the Sphinx begins to take on this role of a god in his own, in his own right. And this god is conceived of as a form of the god Horus, um, a, a form of the god Horus known as Hor em Achet, or Harmachus in Greek. And that name, Hor em Achet, means Horus in the horizon. And what you have when you look at Giza, when you look at the Sphinx um, in between the two pyramids, is essentially a three-dimensional hieroglyph of the word achet, or horizon, which you're looking at there in yellow. So you have these, the mountains here and the sun um, rising in the center. And if you take that away, which I can do there very magically, you have the same thing. You have the pyramids forming the other side of the mountains and the, the sphinx, the statue of the sphinx, um, in the center as that, that sun. So it's a form of Horus that is connected with the solar religion, um, and it is Horus in the horizon. And here you see how this um, is written out in the hieroglyphs up here. Um, there is the god Horus, there is the word M or in, and then here we have Achet or horizon. And here an image of that now God, uh, the, the great Sphinx at, at Giza. Um, and so again, the Horamakit, the Egyptian version of the name, sometimes you will see it referred to in the texts uh, with it, the, the Greek uh, translation of that, um, Harmakis. And so when this transformation happens and the Sphinx at Giza becomes thought of or equated with the deity in his own right, we begin to find um, monuments, both great and small, showing the Egyptians' devotion to this god. So here, um, from the New Kingdom, are two uh, small votive stelae. Um, this one here, dedicated by a man by the name of Montuhor, who was a scribe. The text tells us here that he was a scribe. And up at the top, we have an image of the god Horemachet. So this is the Sphinx at Giza. And behind him, sort of stylistically drawn, are two of the three pyramids um, at Giza. Here, another of these um, stela, this time without the hieroglyphs in the background, but very clearly identified here as Horemachet, Horus in the Horizon, our great sphinx um, at Giza. These two uh, votive stele are dedicated by private individuals, but we also know from looking again at the Egyptian texts that Egyptian kings, pharaohs of the 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom, were also very interested in the Sphinx at Giza in its form as a god. And there are texts that describe some of these New Kingdom pharaohs actually going to the site of Giza and interacting with, visiting with um, the, the Sphinx at Giza in his form as a god. Um, we have from the 18th dynasty, um, a stela, a royal stela, um, belonging to King Amenhotep II. Um, and King Amenhotep II is a bit of a, um, of a jock pharaoh. Um, he's known for his athletic prowess. 
And in his stila, he describes how he was in charge of um, the royal horses. He was put in charge of his father's horses, so in charge of the king's horses. And in the text, it describes how he would ride out to the necropolis at Giza and ride around, and he encountered the, the statue, the giant sphinx there, and he refers to it in the text as, as a god. Um, it is so important to him that he has um, a, it's a small temple constructed there in honor of Harmachus, in honor of Horemachet, the, the sphinx um, god there at the, at the Giza Plateau. Another of the New Kingdom pharaohs, the successor um, of Amenhotep II, in fact, um, Tutmosis IV, also had erected at Giza a very impressive stela that describes his interaction with um, the, the great sphinx at Giza in its form as, as a god. Um, and we learn from the text that like his father, um, Prince Tutmosis uh, was very interested as a youth in riding around on the, the Giza Plateau, riding horses, um, taking part in all sorts of athletic endeavors there, hunting lions. Um, and he describes in this, on this stela how one day he is out doing these kind of things when he begins to get tired and he falls asleep um, beneath the shadow of the, the, of the Sphinx there. And in his dreams, the Sphinx, the god, speaks to him and asks of him a favor. Um, at the top of the stela, very beautifully decorated, you have images of the king, two different images of the king, um, confronting or making offerings to the, the god there. Um, so the king is identified on either side as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, the lord of the two lands, and then his two names are given, um, Menkeperu Re Tutmosis, and he is described as uh, the lord of appearances, and he is also said to have been given life, or to be given life, stability, and dominion by the god depicted on this stela. The god on the stela is identified and speaks. He says, I, me, the god, the Sphinx god, I am the one, um, I give life and dominion to the lord of the two lands, Tutmosis. And furthermore, he says, the Sphinx is speaking now, I cause that Menkeperu Re appears on the throne of Geb and Tutmosis is in the position of Atum. So the two names of the king, the Sphinx, the god is speaking and saying, I'm the one that put him here. Um, and then the very long text down below describes this encounter. And as you'll notice, the stela is, um, is damaged. So we don't have the end of the text, but there is more than enough going on at the beginning of the text that we can see exactly what's happening. And the text describes the events and says that when the king was a youngster, so this is happening before he comes to the throne, he's a prince, um, and he likes to amuse himself in the desert. Um, he shoots at a bronze target, he hunts lions um, and flocks, and he rides in his chariots, and his horses are as fast as can be, faster than the wind, um, and he does this sort of alone. He goes out with only two of his followers. So he, the, the prince does this in secret. And at one point, then the hour came to give rest to his followers. Not to him. He's the prince, and he's very strong and powerful. He doesn't need to rest, but his followers do. And so what they do is they pause at the limbs of Horemachet. That is the statue of the great sphinx. Um, and so that's where they take their rest. And even today, when you go to Giza, to go to the necropolis, it is possible um, to run horses and ride around in the same way that these Egyptian pharaohs of Dynasty 18 describe doing. Um, and the things that he describes in the text, this archery, the horse riding, the lion hunting, all of this that's going on, these are all things 
that the Egyptian pharaohs of the 18th dynasty sort of pride themselves on their athletic abilities. Um, so we have here this wonderful painted ostrica showing a king in the um, in the moment of killing a lion together with his hunting dog. And here, one of those uh, wonderful, large, commemorative scarabs issued during the reign of Amenhotep III, one of a number of different scarabs he issued, and this one is what is known as the lion hunt scarab, where he describes um, his prowess at, at hunting lions. So what the king is describing in the stela fits very well in with our understanding of the presentation of the ideal pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. So they take the rest, um, and the, the, the sphinx is further described. Now then, the great statue of Kepri was lying in his place. Kepri is another form of, of the sun god. Great of power and powerful of majesty, the shadow of Re resting upon it. So all these solar images. Um, the estates of Hutkapta, that is Memphis, the, the great city of Memphis, and all the neighboring cities come to it, their arms raised in adoration before him, carrying many offerings for his ka. So it's describing this statue receiving honor from everybody um, around. So one of those days when he's out hunting, so it happened that Prince Tutmosis came, passing by the time of midday, and he sat down in the shadow of this great god. Sleep seized him, and he falls asleep. And then he hears the Sphinx speaking, saying, look at me, see me, my son, I am your father, and I will give you the kingship on earth in front of all the living ones, and you shall wear the white and red crowns um, upon the throne of Geb, the hereditary prince. The earth shall be yours in its length and breadth and all that the eye of the Lord of all illuminates. So everything is going to be under um, his, his command. Now this, I am your father, I kind of think of this as the Darth Vader moment in ancient Egyptian literature. Um, but the Sphinx, the god, has a favor to ask of him. He's not going to do this. He's not going to allow the prince to become king, you know, just because. Um, he asks him to do him a favor. My face is yours, my heart is yours, you are a protector to me. This is the Sphinx speaking. Um, for my present condition is like that of one that is in need. All my limbs are dismembered as the sands of the desert which I lie have reached me. So run to me to have that done which I desire, knowing that you are my son and my protector. Come forth and I shall be with you, I shall be your leader. What the Sphinx is asking him to do is to dig him out of the sand. The Sphinx has been covered up in sand, so the god is asking the prince to remove him from his sandy, um, his sandy bed. And the prince wakes up from his dream and immediately knows what he has to do in order that the vision come true, in order that he become king. Um, he immediately orders that you know, everything is cleared up for the Sphinx. The text breaks off, but it's pretty clear that this is what happens. And this idea, this is image, again, the very evocative nature of the Egyptian writing, we, we know that there were many points in history, both ancient and modern, when the Sphinx at Giza was almost entirely enveloped in sand. So what this text is describing is, again, this idea that the Giza Plateau is no longer sort of a burial place for pharaohs. It's a little bit abandoned. It's a place where the princes can go and, and do joy rides um, in their chariots. Nobody's really around. The Sphinx asks the king to, the prince, to remove the sand, um, and that's what he does. So you can see this image from probably the late 1800s showing the same kind of thing happening. The Sphinx in, almost covered up to its shoulders um, in sand. This idea of taking a rest um, by the Sphinx is something that we see um, taken uh, by artists and used as inspiration. Um, it's not really related to the ancient Egyptian texts at all, but there's this wonderful painting um, in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, um, Rest on the Flight into Egypt, showing uh, Mary and the, the baby Jesus uh, asleep under the protection, under the watchful eye of the, of the Sphinx. So I just thought, when we're getting near Christmas time, I'll put that in there. 
And to further the connection between sleeping with the Sphinx, um, oddly enough, the museum here also allows people to rest under the protective eye of a Sphinx, albeit not the great Sphinx at Giza, but still a pretty good Sphinx. So what goes on here is the continuation of a tradition that has gone on for thousands of years since at least the time of Tutmosis IV. Now, our, um, we've talked sort of about the great Sphinx at Giza, this idea of what the sort of archetypal Sphinx looks like, the body of a lion and the head of a, of a human, but there are other types of Sphinxes that we find in the Egyptian canon. Um, we see our, our andro Sphinx, so our human-headed Sphinx, probably the most common of them all, but the Egyptians were very creative um, and combined quite a number of different creatures together to form different sorts of sphinxes. So there are examples of falcon-headed sphinxes, known as haraka sphinxes. Um, there are also um, ram-headed sphinxes, known as cryo sphinxes. Um, and if any of you have uh, young children around and are familiar with the game Yu-Gi-Oh!, you can also collect haraka sphinxes and cryo sphinxes in that card game. Um, as I said, the Egyptians, again, this, this creative, this ability to combine um, beings together. We also have examples of the god Seth, um, that, that god of chaos, that god of storms, also can be shown, albeit somewhat rarely, um, in Sphinx form, as you see uh, on this stela here. Now, so we know there are a number of different forms that a Sphinx can take. There are a number of different attributes that sphinxes can have. So if we're talking about an andro sphinx, so a human-headed sphinx, they come in a couple of different flavors. Um, we have what we call maned sphinxes, so examples like these two here, um, one of Hatshepsut over there on the left and one of Amenemhat III um, on the right. And maned sphinxes actually have um, more, they have lion ears, they have um, this, the mane, the actual lion's mane is incorporated into uh, the, the sphinx itself. Um, there are non-mane sphinxes, those are the ones that are just the, the head wearing the Nemi's headdress. There are also ones that are semi-mane, so there might be a bit of a, a ruff that the lions have is indicated on the, on the sphinx. Sphinxes can also take a number of different poses. So we've been looking mostly at our the most common pose, that recumbent lion with the paws outstretched um, and it lying sort of flat on his haunches. But sphinxes can take also more active poses. So we have examples of sphinxes sort of standing um, at attention. We see sphinxes in offering poses where the, the paws of the lion are replaced with human arms which hold um, offering pots or other things that are being offered to uh, various uh, deities. We see really active sphinxes um, in the act of trampling enemies. We find this imagery quite a lot on the sides of thrones. Um, there's a wonderful example in the Metropolitan Museum, a wooden throne that has this trampling sphinx um, design on the side of it. This is a position that we do not find in our canon of, of ancient Egyptian sphinx positions. If any of you have cats, you're very familiar with that position. Um, there is also a, a special form of Sphinx, um, an active Sphinx, we'll call him. Um, this is a, a god, um, separate from the god Harmachus or Horamachet. This is the god Tutu. And he, like the Sphinx itself, like many of these other creatures we've been talking about, is a composite creature. He combines a number of different elements, but he has more elements than just a regular sphinx would have. So he does have the head of a human being and the body of a lion. But you will notice he has another, whoops, <laughs> another lion head popping out here out of his shoulders. His tail is a serpent, and coming out of his paws, emanating from his paws, are knives and scorpions, all sorts of dangerous things. He is 
like Taweret, like the Sphinx in general, the Egyptian Sphinx, a protective deity. And his name, Tutu, means image. And he is collecting all of these different images, these protective images. And they are embodied in one, in one god. Um, and this uh, stela, this image of Tutu, is on display in our magic exhibit. Um, so you can take a look at him up close if you get a chance to wander through there. Um, there are, as I said, these Haraco sphinxes, the body of a lion combined with the head of a falcon. They can also be shown in very active forms. Again, trampling here, trampling enemies. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell, hard to decide what is a Haraco sphinx um, and what is a griffin. And we see griffins um, also depicted in Egyptian art. Griffins seem to be slightly different than sphinxes, but again, we'll lump them into the same group because they do serve a protective function in the ancient Egyptian thinking. And that really brings us to the point. What is the point of the, these big, these massive Sphinx statues, the Sphinx at Giza, these Sphinxes that were set up in front of Egyptian temples? They are there to provide protection. Here you can see, sort of in a very small, um, compact form, this idea. Here is a temple, small temple of Ramses II, located in Nubia. You have the entrance to the temple here, that classic Egyptian pylon form, which, um, not coincidentally, also takes the form of the Achet, or the horizon. So you see it's sort of like the mountains there, and then the place where the sun would be. And in front of this small temple, there is a row of paired guardian sphinxes guarding the pathway that would lead to, to the temple entrance. So these colonnades of sphinxes, whether they're in human form or in ram form um, or various other forms, were a very common feature of Egyptian temples. Um, here a view from Luxor, uh, you can see uh, these, this row of temple, uh, row of, temple, row of um, sphinxes um, that line these pathways, these leading to these processional ways that lead to the, lead to the temple. There's this wonderful, um, as far as I know, unique um, object, which is in the Brooklyn Museum, and it is a sort of mini model of a temple. Um, actually, only the base, I think, is original. The rest of this has been uh, reconstructed, but the reconstruction is based on actual slots that are left in the, the base here. And we can see that there are places left for four paired sphinxes, um, in addition to obelisks and statues of the various kings. Again, you have that pylon entryway. So the sphinx's role, the sphinx's job, was that of protection, protecting important religious structures, um, whether it is something like the necropolis at Giza, protecting the area where the tombs of the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty are, or protecting the entryways into Egyptian temples. Now, not all sphinxes are gigantic. We do have examples here in our collection of very, very small, very, very portable sphinxes. Um, this sad little character over here would fit in the palm of your hand, and he's also a good way to realize that not all ancient Egyptian artisans were masters at their craft. Um, but, you know, you know what it is when you're looking at it. Uh, these are wonderful terracotta sphinxes that were mold made. They could be made in multiples, uh, very easily reproduced. Uh, they were probably produced for um, visitors who came to a temple and wanted to purchase a votive offering for a, um, for a god and these were presented at the temple, perhaps. Um, and many of our scarabs, we have thousands of scarabs in our collection, and dozens of them are decorated on their underside with images of sphinxes, whether they're human-headed sphinxes or ram-headed sphinxes. We have examples of tram trampling sphinxes and standing sphinxes. So the Sphinx, again, as I said at the beginning of this talk, the Sphinx is everywhere. Um, even the palace of Merneptah, 
excavated at Memphis by this museum in the early part of last century, the windows of that palace, um, which are on display in the Lower Egyptian Gallery, have Sphinx imagery. Here, it's a seated Sphinx. This is a, um, a pose that I didn't show you earlier, but seated just like a domestic cat would sit. Um, and again, protective imagery. Um, protecting the, the king, whoever is within the palace itself. Now finally, I just want to introduce you rather quickly to our Sphinx. Many of you are probably very familiar with our Sphinx of Ramses II there in the Lower Egyptian Gallery. Um, some of you may not know um, exactly how it is he came to be here um, in the collection of the Penn Museum. Um, and for that, we have to look to these three men. Um, most of the objects in our collection in the Egyptian section came into the museum as a result of archaeological excavation. This is either archaeological work that Penn Museum's own archaeologists did, or earlier, before we sent our own archaeologists into the field, the museum financially supported other excavators. Um, and then as a result of that financial support, the museum would receive um, a percentage or some of the fines made by that excavator. And so at the turn of the last century, around 1912, let's say, um, we have these three, three important figures for our Sphinx story. We have the father of Egyptian archaeology, Flinders Petrie, who at this time is working at the site of Memphis. Um, Memphis is not very far from modern Cairo. It was the ancient capital of ancient Egypt for much of Egyptian history. Even when it wasn't a capital city, it was an important religious center. So he is excavating there, and he is finding wonderful things. Our museum at the time is um, direct, has the director, uh, George Byron Gordon. Um, his name got cut off on the side there. Um, and Gordon is very interested in building this collection, so the, the museum's collection. We're talking 1911, 1912, very early in the Egyptian section's history, and he wants beautiful things to put on display in the museum. Then we have Eckley Cox who was a Penn alumni, a very wealthy Philadelphian, who was quite interested in archaeology, and in particular, quite interested in ancient Egypt. And it will turn out that Eckley Cox is going to provide the financial backing that Gordon is going to be able to send to Petrie. And as a result of this, some of the things that Petrie finds are going to wind up here in our collection. So Petrie is working at Memphis in the area of the, the temple enclosure of the Ta Temple. The main god of Memphis is the god Ta. Um, and he, he's working in this area here, and lo and behold, what does he discover? Here is a um, satellite view of what it is today. So he's working in this area here. He discovers a sphinx, a rather large and impressive red granite sphinx. And he writes to Director Gordon and offers the Sphinx to the museum. And he says, um, he writes to Gordon and says, Dear Sir, thanks for your letter and your check. Um, during the summer, we found this giant Sphinx. Would your museum be interested in it? And you would think, and I think I've said this before when I've talked about the Sphinx coming to Philadelphia, that. Gordon, the director, gets this letter, and his response isn't, yes, yes, send me this, this is great, this is exactly what we need. His response is, can you send me a picture of what this thing looks like before I decide whether I want it or not? So Petrie does that, he sends the photograph, and Gordon says, yes, this is fine, we'll, we'll take it, it's lovely. And so that's how the, the Sphinx's journey to Philadelphia begins. It's excavated by Petrie at Memphis, offered to the museum, and then Eckley Cox provides the financial support to bring it from Egypt to Philadelphia. At the same time, the same season that Petrie finds our Sphinx, or what will become our Sphinx, he uncovers another Sphinx um, at the same site. And this Sphinx is an absolute monster. It weighs something like 80 tons. 
Um, and Gordon finds out about this Sphinx too and sort of hints around that he might like that one to be sent to Philadelphia as well. And Petra says, no, 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 uh, I think that one's going to stay on site. Um, and in fact, today it makes the, it's the central object in the outdoor museum at the site of, of Memphis today. Um, and knowing what was involved in bringing our Sphinx, which is considerably smaller than the Sphinx, to the museum, I can't imagine how this one would have made it here. In any case, in researching the book um, about the Sphinx, we came across many interesting documents in the Penn Museum archives um, that talk about the Sphinx's uh, transit to Philadelphia. We were able to find um, his traveling papers, his insurance forms. Um, he was insured for a thousand pounds and described on the insurance papers as an old stone or an antique stone. <laughs> It's not a lie, he was, he is. Um, there are letters from the shipping company who were in charge of sort of packing the Sphinx up and getting it onto a ship, kind of complaining. You didn't tell us how big this thing was. It arrived here, it was, as they say in the letter, it arrived nude, so it's not in a crate. Um, what do we do with this thing? And it took a long time, actually, before they were able to find a ship that was um, available and able to take such a large um, stone um, from Egypt to uh, Philadelphia, but here is an image of the ship that um, the, the Sphinx traveled here on. So the Sphinx made a journey from Memphis um, through uh, the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic, it had a brief stop in Virginia, and then arrived in Philadelphia in October of 1913. Um, when it got here, the ship first docked down here in South Philadelphia, but that dock um, was really more for passengers. It didn't have the capability to unload such a massive um, sculpture. So the Sphinx was again sent on a journey up here to Port Richmond, where there were larger docks that had um, the capability of removing large things from ships, big cranes that were used at that point to take um, locomotive engines off of ships, was what was used to take the Sphinx off of the ship. Um, it was then put on a rail car and um, through the city uh, to where the rail ended. Um, and then it was put on a cart and brought across the river through um, what is now Drexel and Penn's campus before it arrived here at the museum. When it arrived um, in Philadelphia, it actually had a, another small delay because the World Series uh, had started and the Philadelphia A's were in the series, so there were no dock hands, no workers available to help unload this thing. Everyone was watching baseball. And there are wonderful um, reports in the newspapers at this time of the, where they interview the Sphinx and he's kind of complaining and saying, what is baseball? I have no idea what baseball is. Um, so he does, he finally arrives and you see the cart on which he, he came here. Um, he's wrapped in, in burlap, so there was no big crate, nothing. Once he got to the museum, again, they were faced with the problem of, well, now what? How do we get him in? Um, so he had to rest overnight on the sidewalk outside. And there were guards stationed there because they were worried people would try to remove souvenirs. Um, and then the next day, he was hoisted um, over the wall. Um, you can see they're beginning the preparation to do this. Uh, and he finally landed in the garden in front of the museum. Now, you might wonder how much it costs to bring a Sphinx all the way from Memphis to Philadelphia. And there are news reports complaining about the heavy cost um, involved in moving the Sphinx. So the grand total was $794 and two cents. Um, it actually cost more to bring the Sphinx from Port Richmond to here than it did to bring it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so the Sphinx winds up in the garden out front by the fish pond, um, and the Sphinx gets to experience Philadelphia winters. The area of the museum in which the Sphinx now resides hadn't been built yet, so the Sphinx arrived, there was nowhere to put him. 
So he stayed out in the garden for a number of years, and there was a lot of concern, particularly on the part of Eckley Cox, who was the man who had given the money to bring the Sphinx here, that the Sphinx might break in half, that it might freeze and crack and be irreparably damaged. Um, and there are newspaper reports at the time saying somebody should buy the Sphinx a blanket, somebody should give him some mittens, it's cold here in Philadelphia. And so finally it's you know, agreed, yeah, we probably should bring the Sphinx inside. And he's brought in from the garden um, right into the main entrance. So where the entrance into the, the gift shop area is, he's sort of scooted through the front door and stays there for a number of years until the Cox wing um, of the museum is completed. And then he is moved into the Cox wing where he stays um, until this very day. This is the only image we could find of the Sphinx in that intermediary location um, inside. And so here he is installed in all of his glory in um, the Cox Wing, which opened in 1926. Um, and after, well, when he was moved in, as most of you probably know, the, the walls to this gallery hadn't been completed yet, so he was able to be brought in through an unfinished wall, and once he was inside, the walls were bricked up and completed. So the Sphinx is not going anywhere unless a hole is blown into the side of the building, which we hope does not happen. Um, just some facts and figures about the size of the Sphinx. Um, his height is about 85, 86 inches tall, which includes the plinth that he sits on, not the modern base that he's on when you look at him in the gallery. He's 152 and a half inches long. He weighs um, 13 tons, 12.9 tons. His weight is a bit of an issue. Sometimes he's 11 tons, sometimes he's 15 tons, but we're going to go with 12.9. Um, and he is made of red granite, and this granite was quarried at Aswan, all the way in Egypt's, in Egypt's southern, southern border. So where he was found was up in the north. So even just thinking about the journey that the, the roughed out stone made um, from the quarries at Aswan to Memphis, where the statue was eventually erected, it's a tremendous um, accomplishment that the ancient Egyptians did, just moving him throughout Egypt. Um, in ancient times. Um, he is what we would call a colossal sphinx. He is one of the largest sphinxes on record. Um, of course, the great sphinx at Giza is, is the biggest, and he is carved, as I said, out of the living bedrock. Um, he is not moving anywhere. Uh, the next biggest is that other sphinx discovered by Petrie at Memphis that clocks in at about 80 tons. Um, and then there are two pairs of sphinxes, um, a pair that is now in St. Petersburg, um, which I think are estimated to weigh about, I don't have my glasses on, 35 tons. Um, then there are two at Alexandria that are probably about 20 tons. And then there is the colossal sphinx in the Louvre, um, which is probably about 18 to 20, and then our Sphinx. So people ask how large is he? He is the largest ancient Sphinx in the Western Hemisphere, and he is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if you count the pairs as two separate things, if you count the pairs as one, he's the sixth biggest. Uh, so here are just images of these really big sphinxes. So our sphinx at Giza, um, our sphinx at Memphis, the 80-ton sphinx, the pair in St. Petersburg today, um, then the next biggest, the pair that are at, um, in Alexandria, dating to the Ptolemaic period, the great sphinx from Tanis in the Louvre, and then our beloved sphinx here. He is not <laughs> the biggest Sphinx in America. Um, the Sphinx that fronts the Luxor Casino in Las Vegas is actually bigger than the Great Sphinx at Giza. So he is <laughs> the biggest Sphinx. Um, our Sphinx, uh, another just thing to point out is another feature of him is that he, like many ancient Egyptian statues and things, are covered in text. So you might wonder what the inscriptions are that are on the Sphinx. And Basically, they are the names of the pharaoh, the name of Ramses II, um, 
cover the front of his chest, the, the base goes all the way around. Uh, those are all inscriptions of Ramses II. And then Ramses' son, Pharaoh Merneptah, carved his own name on the shoulders of the Sphinx. So there are two different pharaohs' names on there, but the primary one is Ramses II. Here are just some close-ups of the um, cartouches of Ramses II. So he is the lord of the two lands. His name, Usur Ma'atre Seta Penre, and he is the lord of appearances, Ramses, beloved of Amun, Ramsu Mary Amun, uh, given life forever. And then similarly on the front of the Sphinx, you have again those titles repeated, the Lord of the Two Lands and the Lord of Appearances, the sort of mirror image decoration on the front. The protective goddesses of Upper and Lower Egypt, Nechbet and Wajet are shown on either side. And then the text on the side is what we call the five-fold titulary of the king. Ancient Egyptian pharaohs had five different names. The last two of those names, um, the birth name and the throne name, were in, um, in cartouches. The rest of the names, the other three, weren't. Um, and these names, while there are a number of pharaohs who share the name Ramses, these complete titularies, these five different names, are unique to each pharaoh. And basically, these fivefold titularies work kind of like the king's mission statement. They describe what he has done or what he will do for Egypt. They describe relationships he has with different gods and goddesses. So, here, the text reads, um, May the Horus, the mighty bull, beloved of Ma'at, the goddess Ma'at, Lord of the two lands, Usur Ma'at Re, Setepenre, the name of Ramses II, the Lord of Appearances, Ramses, beloved of the god Amun, and then one of his names, the golden Horus name. He is strong of years and great of victories. Um, the Lord of the two lands, Usur Ma'at Re, Setepenre, uh, the Lord of Appearances, uh, Ramses, beloved of Amun, may he live like Ray, like the sun god. And on the other side, uh, similar sort of thing going on there, may the Horus, the mighty bull, beloved of Ma'at, the Lord of the two lands, Usur Ma'at Ray, Setepenre, Lord of Appearances, Ramses, beloved of Amun. Then another name, the two ladies' name, defender of Egypt and binder of the foreign land. So this describes Ramsey's activity in protecting his country from uh, foreign attack, the lord of the two lands, and then it repeats, may he live like Ray. So that in a nutshell is everything you need to know, or well, maybe not everything, there might be a few extra things in the book, um, but basically what you need to know about our, our uh, sphinx here in the Egyptian section. Uh, given the time of year that it is, I hope no one will be offended if I also let you know that this Sphinx is probably the only Sphinx that has a custom-made Santa hat <laughs> that I made. <laughs> and you can see the horror and bewilderment on my son's face uh, there. My son Alexander has a very rough life growing up with two Egyptologist parents, so... I think that perfectly sort of sums up his experience. Um, so there you have it, uh, Christmas with, with the Sphinx. And also I'd like to throw out there a bet that all the other uh, great beasts in our lecture series, I bet there aren't Christmas ornaments for all of them. Now, I might be wrong, but there are multiple examples of Sphinx Christmas ornaments. And speaking of hybrid creatures, if you are considering a holiday meal, coming up, there are many holidays. I recommend this one. <laughs> now, at almost 13 tons, um, at 15 minutes a pound, you might have to start cooking it about three or four months ago, but I'm sure it will be delicious. So that's it for the Sphinx. I'm happy to take any questions, if anyone might have a question or two. As a question. That is an excellent question. The question is, do sphinxes always have their tails wrapped around to the right? And the answer to that does seem to be yes. That that 
seems to be the position. Most of the sphinxes you look at do have the tail curling to that direction. Why that might be the case, I'm not entirely sure. I think we may have found one or two examples that don't have it in that, that way. And it is sort of strange, because when you think about Egyptian art, you think about the symmetry. And so you think about these paired sphinxes that would be lining temple processional routes. And you would assume, with the Egyptians' love of symmetry, that the sphinxes on one side would have the tails going one way, and, but it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be the case. So I, I don't, maybe that should be the next thing we look at, is why. <laughs> why with the tails? But it's a good observation. Yes? A uh, quick question. You mentioned the uh, Sphinx uh, was uh, a protective uh, person, deity or whatever. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on what the protection was from? Was it foreign enemies? Was it from within? Uh, protection from drought, uh, starvation, whatever? Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what did, this, know it's my turn. what did the Sphinx um, protect from? And I would say, I would, I would hazard a guess that... Um, the protection that the Sphinx as a god would offer would be the same type of protection that any of the deities in ancient Egypt would protect. I mean, the relationship that the Egyptians had with the gods and goddesses, the relationship that the king had with the gods and goddesses, is all meant to keep things in balance. So we have in ancient Egypt the idea of ma'at, or order. You know, so that's the ideal thing, that everything be going according to ma'at, according to balance, according to harmony. And anything that would disrupt that harmony, whether it's an illness or an invasion of foreign peoples or a drought or this or that, would affect harmony, would affect ma'at. So all of these images at their core, I think, are trying to avert the disruption of, of Ma'at, trying to repel what we call isfet, or chaos. Um, so I think that that might be, sort of in the broad sense, what, what the Sphinx's role as a protector is. When you look at the Sphinx, the, these Sphinx avenues leading up to temples, I mean, the temple is going to be one of the most sacred spaces in, in Egypt, and you want to avoid the possibility that anything evil, <laughs> any malevolent force in any form um, not come near the temple. So there are a number of different things the Egyptians did to kind of, to try to avert that, and these sphinxes would be one of those um, opportunities. Do we have a question over here? Yes. Oh. Um, in, in light of recent upticks in terrorism, I was curious if um, what the Egyptian Bureau of Antiquities is doing to secure these, you know, priceless works of art. Are they adding, you know, security? Are they really, you know, beefing it up? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Egyptians have been working very hard to protect um, their, the sites, the an antiquity sites, the museums. Um, at the be very beginning, after the first uh, Egyptian revolution, there were examples, and, and very well publicized examples, of uh, you know, the, the big break into the Cairo Museum, um, and examples of sites and magazines and storehouses of various sites that had been looted. Um, but this happened sort of quite early on in the uh, revolution. Um, and I think almost immediately the, the Egyptian government took steps to prevent this from happening. Um, I think when you're talking about a, a country that has, I mean, e even here we see looting at archaeological sites. So it's something that does happen. Um, regardless of, of the area of the world you're talking about. But our work um, at Abydos, you know, it's been very carefully um, guarded, protected by the Egyptian authorities. Um, they have done everything possible to keep us and the sites safe. Um, I feel no um, concern going to work in Egypt. Um, I was just there in uh, May and June. 
Um, I'm normally there twice a year, and I bring my son um, with me, who is now 13. Um, if I felt it was unsafe, we certainly wouldn't do that. But yes, they are um, doing, I think, a very good job um, with the the things that they have at hand to protect the sites. And certainly us as archaeologists working in the field, we're also helping in that protection as well. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, I think it was Flinders Petrie, but somebody mentioned that there could be uh, a, an image of the head that has been so badly eroded, uh, created so we could see what perhaps it looked like. Mm -hmm. Has any, anyone ever done anything about that? At the, the head of our sphinx here. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. When we looked at the letters in the archives, there was a suggestion made by, I think, Director Gordon at the time when Petrie offered the sphinx. So Petrie says, well, the, the face is very weathered, but the body is sort of in pristine condition. Um, and Gordon kind of toys with the idea of having the face, having the head reconstructed, and then decides against that. Um, when we were preparing the book, we sort of played around with, um, you know, with Photoshop, with sort of digital means, to try and work out what the Sphinx would have looked like if it had its original face. And so we took images of statues of Ramses II from the same time period and sort of transposed them digitally on the Sphinx, you know, to get an idea of how it looks. Uh, you know, whether it would have looked exactly like that or not, it's unsure, but it kind of gives you an idea. Um, the other thing that we toyed with, with regard to the reconstructions, is the fact that this Sphinx would have originally been painted. So we look at it now as a, a single color red granite block, but it almost certainly would have had um, at least element, elements of it painted in various colors. So we, we also produced a couple of images like that of what it might have looked like with some of the pigment, the original pigment still on it. Um, and another thing we did, um, which I didn't mention, was that there is also a possibility that our Sphinx may have originally had an additional crown on top. Um, a lot of the Sphinxes from this time period uh, wear the double crown. So you have images of, of Ramses II Sphinxes wearing that crown. Um, so we played around with that too. And it is, it's a little uh, disconcerting to look at the, the reconstructions because we're so used to seeing our Sphinx look the way he does now. So I, I am kind of glad that he wasn't reconstructed um, when he was brought here 100 years ago. I think he's you know, very um, evocative looking the way he is. He's a little, little more mysterious, his, his weathered gaze. Put your pictures on the wall so we can go and see as we walk by. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So um, you showed us pictures of the pharaoh hunting lions, which I get, you know, the whole virility and, and heroism and masculinity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of curious because there would seem to me to be a dichotomy between all of the sphinxes, who all have the bodies of lions, mm -hmm. uh, and their concept of protection while the pharaohs out there kill them. So what do you think about that? Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, but when you look at almost all of the Egyptian, well, Egyptian deities in general, um, you have cow-headed ones, bull-headed ones, ram-headed ones, you know, lots of foodstuffs that the Egyptians would have been eating. So um, for the ancient Egyptians, yes, they did have animal-headed gods. They had gods that were completely animal in form, but if we take, for example, um, some of the sacred bulls, there are a couple of different bulls that um, were worshipped as a living animal. So the apis bull is a, is a good example of that. There was only one apis bull at a time, so it wasn't a case like in, in other parts of the world where the, the bull or the cow is a sacred animal and you cannot injure any of them. There was just this one particular special bull that had to be protected. And maybe that's the way, that's this dichotomy that you're seeing with there is the lions that the king is hunting, there's the lion that is helping the king, you know, fight the enemies, and then there is the lion that's sort of combined with the king. But I guess it is only that one particular 
you know, lion slash <laughs> human that is the god, not every single lion that you would encounter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess that's it. No one has any more questions? Thank you.